Please note, Please that, note this that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, like and share. Hello everyone and welcome back to another live stream with me, Gizela K. This is Grizzly True Crime and today we are going to be looking at breaking news in the Long Island serial killer case. I have covered this case before, the Gilgo Four, Shannon Gilbert, the Long Island serial killer, all of those names and the unsolved cases. Um, and today we're going to quickly do a recap. We're going to look at the press conference as well and look at the suspect that they have arrested. This is breaking news from today. I know everyone's like, whoa, today, um, as we were watching a trial together, and so we'll be going over it now. I just quickly want to um, put up my presentation here before we look at the press conference, just so that we could just see some of the basics, and then I will power through it, okay? I'm going to power through, because on my playlist, you can see me go through this at a much slower rate with a lot of waffle time, okay? So, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Please like and share so that others can also find the stream. All right, so the Long Island serial killer is, wow, an unsolved case that we're gonna look at now. Just hold on. Can't believe that the suspect was, as usual, as usual, in plain sight, right? So Shannon Gilbert went missing on May 1st of 2010 from Oak Beach, Long Island, after visiting a first time client, Joseph Brewer. She made a 911 call and we listened to that call together on those episodes on the playlist too. The playlist is in the description box. At 4.51 a.m. and ran around the gated community banging on doors and asking for help saying that they were going to kill her. Possibly, in her mind, referring to Brewer and her driver, Michael Pack. The search for her began one month after her disappearance. Okay, so this was one missing person and when the officers then looked for this one missing person, they found a lot of bodies. So, they say... And I'm powering through for a reason, because I do have this as a deep dive at a much lower pace. Okay, I just want to make sure we're all up to speed. We're on the same page that we're going to watch the press conference together. So the search for her began one month after her disappearance. Officer John Mullia from Suffolk County PD and his cadaver dog, Blue, embarked on a search that would last almost two years. Blue alerted to the scent of human remains along Ocean Parkway, and then the Gilgo Four were discovered. Eventually, the remains of 10 people, including one man and a toddler, were found before Shannon was found. The police realized that they had stumbled upon the dumping grounds of an undetected serial killer, and now the suspect's been arrested, okay? Searching for Shannon Gilbert evolved into searching for a serial killer who operated for more than 20 years in Long Island and still has not been identified until today. Until today. That's the point. That's the point. <laughs> Which is incredible. So, yeah, we'll, we will be watching that trial together, too, if it's, you know, if they stream it and all that. So in December 2010, the killer is known as the Long Island Serial Killer, the Craigslist Ripper or the Gilgo Beach Killer. On December 11, 2010, a routine search led to the discovery of human remains in a burlap bag along Ocean Parkway close to Gilgo Beach. The remains were later identified as Melissa Bartholomew, a woman who went missing from the Bronx on July 12, 2009. After she went missing, her sister received multiple phone calls that taunted and tortured her using vulgar language. Example, I'm watching your sister's body rot. Now, if that turns out to be this guy, ooh, my word. More police officers joined in the search and three more victims' remains were found in the Gilgo Beach area. Maureen Brainard Barnes, Megan Waterman, and Amber Lynn Costello. The discovery became known as the Gilgo Four and the Gilgo Beach Murders. All four women had advertised their services on Craigslist and they had been all been found wrapped in burlap sacks. They were murdered at another location and dumped along a remote stretch of Long Island Highway, all within a quarter of a mile of each other. Okay, so this is great news, says Geeking Me Out. This is great news. I'm showing you this so you can also remember, you know, who are the victims and what are we dealing with? So the Gilgo Four, Maureen Brainard Barnes, 25, and Melissa Bartholomew, 24. There were lots of details as well, which right now I'm just going to go forward on. We can deep dive this. I'll do a video on this probably um, at another time, okay? We've got Megan Waterman, 22, and Amberlyn Costello, 27. And they talk about here, I've made a, they, me, <laughs> I made a presentation where it lists all the details um, about when they went missing, 
and all of that, right? Um, so you can pause and read if you want to watch the replay. They say the search for Shannon and possibly other victims remains in the area were paused during the winter months and resumed back in March of 2011. By April 4th, the remains of four more victims were found just two miles east from where the Gilgo Four were found near Oak Beach and Gilgo Beach. Two additional victims' remains were discovered on April 11th of 2011 after the search expanded into the Nassau County, five miles west of the Gilgo Four. Um, Tan says, question, if he has murdered in the recent years, I believe we'll look at the press conference, but I think that this whole investigation could have been, we'll see. They do talk about there could be more victims, that's the point. Okay, so we're going to listen to the press conference together and be taking notes. They say, two additional victims' remains were discovered on April 11, 2011, after the search expanded to the Nassau County. A total, 10 victims found in the same area, which became known as the victims of Lisk, the Long Island serial killer, or the Gilgo Beach killer. So you can see a little case timeline there. I will also put in really great resources. There's some really great map time in this case. There's really great uh, websites. There's one that I would recommend in particular with a full timeline as well if you want to deep dive it a little more. Okay, so Jessica Taylor, Valerie Mack. You can see how they mapped it out here. Okay. Oh, Long Island. Official Lisk victims. Maureen Brainard uh, Bond, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, Amber Lynn Costello, Jessica Taylor, Valerie Mack, a toddler female, DNA linked to Jane Doe Peaches, an Asian man dressed as a woman, and victims 9 and 10 were a female skull and a bag of female bones, both found in nearby Nassau County. So that's, it's quite, this case is huge. So this is huge news that they've actually arrested somebody, a suspect, after all this time. That's why I'm telling you this, right? Uh, thank you so much, Angela. You say so glad you're covering it. I live in Suffolk County, not far. Remember living through this. So scary. Thank you, and thank you for supporting the channel for seven months. Okay. We're still powering through. We're almost there. You can see in early December, you can see they found Sh Shannon Gilbert's purse and a mobile phone in Oak Beach Marshland. Two days later, a quarter of a mile east of her belongings, Gilbert's remains were located. She's not considered a Lisk victim, according to the police, and is believed to have died from accidental drowning in the marsh that she was found in. In 2020, former Suffolk County Police Commissioner Geraldine Hart released previously undisclosed evidence to the public in an effort to advance the investigation. Police released photos of a belt believed to be handled by the suspect, not belonging to any of the victims. In 2022, current Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney K. Harrison established a multi-agency task force, and they obviously did a brilliant job, that includes representatives from the FBI, the New York State Police, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, and the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office to reinvigorate the investigation and bring the person or persons responsible for these crimes to justice. Right? So, I quickly want to tell you this, then we're going to look at the press conference, then we're going to see an article to see, well, what does he look like? Show us his face. Who is this and does it match what this is, right? What do we know about the Long Island serial killer? Based on common characteristics of the victims and forensic evidence, police believe that at least 10 victims were the work of one killer, the Long Island serial killer. They believe the span of the crimes was from February 1996 to 2010 or 2013. The modus operandi is strangulation, bludgeoning and post-mortem dismemberment. The signature, calling victims' relatives with a cell phone and taunting them. Pathology, stalker and serial killer. And Alias, the Long Island serial killer, Lisk, the Gilbert Go Beach killer, the Ocean Parkway killer, the Craigslist Ripper, of course, you know, these killers always get cool names. I disagree with that, but yes, it, they do. The Seashore serial killer, the Gilgo killer, and the Long Island Ripper. Out of 10 victims, an Asian male who was dressed in female clothing, a toddler, and one female victim remain unidentified. The, unident oh, sorry, the identified victims were all sex workers who advertised their services on Craigslist. The Asian male died from blunt force trauma and the baby by undetermined means. The killer speculatively strangled the victims with a belt. A picture of a belt was released in January of 2020, January 16th, right? Welcome, Lalo, me to membership. So the LISC profile, Long Island serial killer profile, Jim Clemente, a former 
FBI Supervisory Special Agent Profiler and former New York State Prosecutor and producer on CBS's Criminal Minds, believes that this killer was between his mid-20s to late 40s, is married, has a girlfriend, is organized, is well-educated and well-spoken, has a stable job, owns an expensive car or truck. Keep all this in mind. Are you taking notes? <laughs> um, is very familiar with Jones Beach Island, where he possibly lives or used to live, is very familiar with Ocean Parkway, has access to burlap sacks, may have knowledge of law enforcement techniques or may have been a police officer himself. Example, his calls to Melissa's sister did not last long enough to pinpoint his location and were made from crowded places such as Times Square. Likely a sexual sadist and he has a pattern of striking in the summer months. Maybe a fantasy or maybe a time when family are away for the holidays. So there was a tip line, one, well there still is, so if you see what we're going to see today and you have a tip to submit, you can still submit tips to 1-800-220-TIPS. Okay, so other profilers um, include that he may have been treated in hospital for a poison ivy infection in the past. Why? Because he left the victims on a 10 mile stretch of remote poison ivy covered dunes just off Ocean Parkway on Jones Beach Island. Serial killer experts say that they believe that the current killer is fueled by similar impulses as shown by his desire to call the teenage sister of one of his victims using the victim's cell phone and mock or scare her. That gives me an idea that he is a sadist. That would be reflected in his relationship and jobs. He's the one who laughs when a cat gets run over or when a kid falls off his bike. He likes the suffering of others and he really likes it when he can cause it or witnesses, says Jim Clemente. Joel Rifkin, a convicted serial killer, said that he thinks it would be someone like a landscaper, contractor or fisherman. Okay. This is someone who can walk into a room and seem like your average Joe, said Scott Bond, an assistant professor of sociology at Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, and a serial killer researcher. He has to be persuasive enough and rational enough that he's able to convince these women to, to meet him on these terms. He has demonstrated social skills. He may even be charming. And there are videos of him on YouTube, and <laughs> it does seem so. He's quite bubbly, charismatic, charming, I suppose one could say. In hindsight, a suspect, innocent or proven guilty, but you know. So there's with the, some POIs, persons of interest in the past that we actually went over as well. The, the, some of these are like red flags, but not one of these is him. Not one of the ones that the public went over is him. This one was quite the red flag, Dr. Peter Hackett. <laughs> mm hmm. Yes, indeed. This one as well. So, the Long Island serial killer, are you ready for the press conference now let, let me resize it for you quickly stand by and if it's I'll make sure that the sound is also boosted so let's go like this okay the press conference uh, finished just a little while ago so you're not too late on it if you already watched it well now you're watching it here with us so thank you for being here okay like this and let's play it took office in January of 2022. I made. I was checking the sound. I just want to make sure it's boosted now. Made uh, Gilgo a priority. I made Gilgo a priority before I took office. I met uh, with the victims' families, uh, some of whom I'm proud to have standing with us today, and I told them that we were going to handle this case differently. We were going to do it differently. And that when I showed up, you weren't going to see me calling the media and being on Gilgo Beach with a giant uh, um, magnifying lens looking for clues 12 years after the case. What I was going to do was I was going to work with my task force. We were going to form a task force. We were going to work with the Suffolk County Police Department. We were going to work with the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office. We were going to work with the New York State uh, Police. We were going to work with our FBI. And we were going to form this task force, and we were going to work together, and we were going to we were going to use the grand jury, the power of the grand jury, to cut to to reach a determination in this case. Because the grand jury has two things: it has power, it has reach. You could obtain documents, you could interview witnesses, but the other thing that the grand jury has, the grand jury has secrecy. No one knows what you do when you operate a grand jury proceeding. 
I'm just going to pause it for a second. The sound is only in my left ear, so I assume the way that the audio worked at this press conference, you know how press conferences go, you guys. You know it. <laughs> that is where the boost started. That's why we need the boost. So I can only hear it in my left ear, which is thankfully my good ear. My right ear is not so good. So I hope that you can hear it if you can't and you only have one ear in. Make sure you put it in the other ear. Okay, here we go. And we knew that when we were investigating this case and it, when we dealt with the media or whatever it was we were doing, um, we, were, we were playing uh, before a party of one because we knew uh, the person responsible for these murders would be looking at us. So we were very careful uh, how we, we, we handled the investigation. We maintained the integrity of the investigation. Uh, most, important, uh, most importantly of all, we maintained the secrecy uh, of that investigation, and I think that's uh, that's paid dividends uh, as we've seen today. Now, um, I, you know, I I I think that uh, you know when we had the uh, the task force, uh, the first thing we did got together with uh, um, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison, uh, and we formed the task force. Our first meeting. Uh, was February, February 1st of 2022. Uh, and what we did, what all of the agencies here, we made the commitment. We were going to take our talented, almost talented investigators. So in the district attorney's office, we took uh, uh, ADAs, myself included. We took analysts. We took detective investigators. And they worked on a daily basis with other talented investigators from all of the agencies here. Um, and uh, we started that in February 1st, in 2022. Six weeks later, on March 14th, 2022, the name Rex Hurman was first mentioned as a suspect uh, in the Gilgo case. A New York State uh, investigator was able to... Uh, to uh so if you didn't hear that, Rex Hurman, this is the guy. I just want to quickly show you, then we'll continue on. This, this is the guy right here. And we're going to look at an article afterwards and go over everything, okay? But there he is, the suspect. I believe he's 59 years old now. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, indeed. Okay, so let's continue on. Um, identify him in a database. Uh, and from that point on, we use the power of the grand jury, over 300 subpoenas and search warrants, uh, looking into this uh, this individual's background to bring us to this day. So I'm I am uh, I'm proud. I, I know that this case is over, but I'm proud of what we've accomplished up to this point. I know we have more to accomplish, but I'm also uh, thankful thankful for the partnership uh, of of the task force because certainly without the participation of the task force, we wouldn't be standing here. Um, you know, before I, I, you know, I thank some, some folks and, and turn it over to, uh, to uh, our, our partners, I just want to talk a little bit about the, the evidence in the case. Uh, I know uh, a lot of people know about the case. As I indicated, uh, the, uh, the victims went missing between July of 2010 and September, uh, I'm sorry, July of 2007 and uh, September of 2010. Uh, and uh, in December of 2010, they were... Uh, the, their, their bodies were recovered. Uh, they were buried in a similar fashion, in a similar location, um, uh, in, a, in a similar way. Uh, all the women were petite. Uh, they were, um, they, they all did the same thing for a living. Uh, they all advertised the same way. Uh, and there were, uh, immediately, there were similarities with regard uh, to the, to the, uh, the crime scenes. Uh, all the women's, all the women were bound at the head, uh, at the midsection, uh, uh, or at the chest and later at the legs. Um, the other thing I think that, that um, uh, was, was, uh, that's been talked about in the, uh, in the media was they were bound by um, burlap. Uh, media, uh, that has taken a life of its own in the media, and the burlap has, has been described or thought to be uh, the burlap that's used at a nursery for uh, it, that's not the burlap that was used in this case. The burlap is it was camouflage burlap uh, used for duck blinds of so hunting. Um, uh, so uh, I, obviously it, it, it was used to hide, uh, purposely hide the bodies. Um, one thing that became immediately apparent 
uh, th was at the time of the uh, each of the murders, uh, the murderer, the the defendant, Herman, uh, he got a a uh, he got a, a cell phone uh, and a burner phone, which uh, which is prepaid and anonymous. And for each of the murders, he got an individual burner phone, and he used that to communicate with the victims. Uh, then shortly after uh, the death of the victims, uh, he then would uh, would get rid of the burner phone. Uh, and uh, right away in December of 2012, uh, FBI uh, cast analysts, uh, special agents with the cast unit of the FBI, they immediately began looking at that cell site uh, uh, data. They compared the victims' phones with, uh, with the burner phones, and they immediately uh, honed in on some, some sim similarities, specifically uh, in the Massapequa Park area. And they looked at the, an area of a confluence of four cell towers, uh, and they realized that this was, had uh, significance because uh, the, the uh, perp perpetrator of these crimes was probably located within this area uh, during, at or around the times of the murderer. Uh, and that was mapped out, that was called the box, and it was an area uh, in Massapequa Park. Uh, the FBI also managed to do that for an area in mid midtown Manhattan. Um, and so that was, that was an investigative lead. The other uh, investigative lead at the time was even though there, there was a significant amount of time that elapsed with regard to uh, before the, 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 uh, the victims were recovered, there was some, uh, some significant evidence recovered. Uh, specifically, there was a uh, um, hair recovered from Maureen uh, Brainerd Barnes from a belt buckle that was around her legs. Uh, there, uh, with regard to Megan Waterman, uh, there were three hairs recovered. Um, uh, from from her, uh, one uh, from around her head area, one from around her, her her leg area in the burlap, and then there was one caught in between the tape, uh, and uh, that was recovered. Uh, Amber Costello also had a hair, a significant hair that was recovered uh, during the time uh, during the, the time of the recovery. But uh, again, uh, the crime scene because it w was out there for so long and because. Uh, it was exposed to the elements, uh, those hairs were degraded, so you couldn't use traditional DNA um, analysis on it. You would, uh, you would have to wait uh, and use mitochondrial DNA. And back in uh, 2010, the technology wasn't there for mitochondrial DNA. So the investigation proceeded, but also technology proceeded as well. Uh, and then in January and February of 2022, we've, we formed the task force. We began working uh, collectively, uh, and then a mere six weeks later, on March 14, 2022, Rex Yerman was identified for the first time. Uh, and the ma manner in which that was done was uh, the New York State investigator looked at a database. Uh, Amber Costello, the day before her uh, disappearance on September 1, uh, 2010, uh, she uh, uh, con uh, she um, met with an, an individual for the purposes of, of having him pay her money uh, for, for her services. Um, but she, uh, she, would involve, she involved herself in a ruse where once the, the individual gave her, uh, gave her money, and, uh, uh, other individuals came into the, the house, pretended to be a significant others, confronted the individual, uh, with the purpose of, of making that individual uncomfortable, having him leave without retrieving his money. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, so uh, that individual was identified as, as a person who was between 6'4 and 6'6, uh, a, a large man, thickly built, not necessarily overly muscular, but just a naturally uh, big person with glasses, white, uh, and, and dark hair. Uh, also of significance was... Um, that the fact that he was driving a dark colored or black uh, av uh, uh, first uh, first generation uh, Chevrolet Avalanche with a, a, a very uh, unique feature that was between the, the it's a pickup truck so it was between the cab and the bed uh, and that was identified again that was back which is exactly what Jim Clemente said that's what he said <laughs> that he's going to have an expensive type of pickup truck. Whoa! Uh, in uh, 2010, 
but it, w it wasn't until uh, March of, of, of 2022 uh, that that database uh, was, by, was, was, dis was searched uh, by the, the task force, uh, and this individual uh, uh, was, was identified. Uh, that, I, uh, that individual was uh, Rex Hurman, the defendant. Uh, and right away, there were some con commonalities that came right to the fore. Rex Hurman, 6'4", largely uh, a large person, not necessarily uh, muscular, but a, a very uh, physically large person. Uh, he has glasses. Uh, he has, he has that, the dark hair. And also, a particular note, he owned, at the time, that first generation Chevy Avalanche. <coughs> Uh, but there was more. Uh, he lived at 105 First Avenue, which was located within that box area that the FBI first uh, discovered in, in 2012. Uh, but there was more. Uh, also, he worked at the time at an architect, as an ar and, uh, he owned his own architectural firm uh, at an address at 19 West 36th Street in Mid Midtown Manhattan. And that was also the area of interest that was identified by. If you don't like commentary, you can go watch the press conference all without me, right? Right. OK, I just want to say that that is what Jim Clemente also said, that he's going to be like in construction or something with a pickup truck. I mean, damn. OK, I mean, Jim Clemente has got incredible experience, so I'm not surprised, but I just like to give credit, you know, where it's due. And that was an incredible profile. OK, here we go. By the FBI in 2012. Uh, again, that was March 14th, uh, 2022. Uh, and from that point on, our, po our partners and uh, my office, we used the grand jury to continue to investigate. And we executed over 300 subpoenas, search warrants pertaining to this individual to find out more information. Uh, one of the things that we did is we followed him because we wanted to get an abandonment sample of his DNA, uh, which we were able to do. Uh, we also got uh, DNA samples, abandonment samples from his family. And then we went back and we got mitochondrial DNA testing. And with regard to, um, you know, and, you know, uh, there's, an, there's a, uh, an aspect of New York State law that doesn't allow me to talk about uh, DNA testing, uh, specifically at press conferences. It's, um, so I can't do that. However, at the... Um, at the uh, uh, arraignment, uh, and also when we filed our bail letter, we talked about the significance of that uh, evidence. So, if anyone needs to see that, but but uh, suffice to say, uh, that evidence w was significant, uh, especially with regard to uh, the other evidence that we had developed. But it was uh, there was uh, another interesting aspect. We looked at the Yerman family uh, travel records, and we learned that during the murders of uh, the last three women, um, Bartholome, Waterman, and Costello, that during the commission of those murders, the, the, uh, the defendant's wife and children were, at, were out of New York State, and he was alone in the tri-state area. Uh, we also went back and looked at his cell site records, and we, were, we, we compared his personal cell site records with that of the four target phones, and we saw that there was areas of commonality. In other words, that whenever the, the target phones would, uh, would, would bounce off a cell tower, if, if the uh, Yerman uh, personal phone uh, bounced off a, a, a tower, it was always consistent and in close proximity uh, with the target phones. And at no time was there ever an instant where those target phones were, for instance, in New Jersey while uh, the defendant was, was on Long Island. Uh, so that was completely um, uh, consistent. The other thing that we looked at was uh, we looked at his use of burner phones, uh, and we, we followed using the grand jury, using the great investigative help from our partners. We followed his use of burner phones. We were able to uh, identify seven separate burner phones that he used. We were able to use fictitious uh, or fraudulent email addresses and get Google warrants, and from there we got his searches, uh, and we learned uh, what we, what uh, the individual, what the defendant was searching. Uh, in a 14-month period, he had over 200 searches pertaining to uh, the Gilgo investigation.
typical, right? This typical, you know? Suspect, suspected serial killer at this point, but damn, can't wait to see those Google searches and he was Googling it up. He's been following this case closely. Classic, isn't it? Oh my word. Uh, not only with, uh, was he looking at uh, in investigative insight, uh, he was looking, trying to figure out how is the task force using cell phones to try to figure out what's happening. What are the developments with regard to the task force? And this, uh, this really um, um, supported our decision to keep our investigative um, focus secret because we knew that this one person would be watching and we didn't want to give him uh, any insight into what we were doing. And we also didn't want him to know just how close we were getting. Uh, so we maintain the, the, the grand jury secrecy and we maintain the integrity of our investigation. Uh, in addition to those, those uh, um, uh, Gilgo searches, he was searching, compulsively searching pictures of the victims, but not only pictures of the victims, pictures of their, uh, their uh, relatives, their, their, their sisters. We knew it because he made those calls. If it's him, whoever did it, they, they, whoever did it, contacted the families. We just went over that in the presentation. Oh, my word, this is so active. Please like and share so that others can come here and know about this news with us. This is <laughs> incredible. I love to see the, the, the timeline as we went the presentation and then like the profile that someone like Jim Clemente made incredible. And then to hear it now, to be like, yep, OK, that happened. And that is just wow. What a, what breaking news, huh? Uh, their children. Uh, and he was trying to locate those individuals. Uh, in addition to that, there was a lot of uh, torture, uh, porn, and and uh, um, what you would consider, uh, you know, uh, um, depictions of women uh, being abused, uh, being raped, and being killed. Um, in addition to all of that, uh, we continued to look, uh, and. Uh, we uh, were able to uh, determine uh, that that Chevy Avalanche that was used during the commission of the Amber Costello crime, uh, that Chevy Avalanche was in South Carolina. And again, with the help of our uh, partners, uh, we were able to capture, uh, we were able to seize that uh, uh, Chevy Avalanche pursuant to a search warrant, and we're certainly going to analyze that. In addition to that, uh, pursuant to the arrest of the defendant last night by the Suffolk County uh, Police Department, we, we obtained one of his burner phones, his last burner phones. Uh, the investigate, as I said, the, this case is not over. It's only beginning. We're continuing to execute search warrants, and we anticipate getting more evidence. Uh, before I, I turn it over to my partners, I, I, I want to I wanna thank a lot of people in the room. First and foremost, I want to thank the victims in this case. You know, it's always inspiring as a prosecutor when you get to meet uh, the victims. Uh, and while sometimes our defendants could embody the very worst of humanity, it seems that invariably our victims embody the very best of what it means uh, to be human. And uh, in this case, it was no, no different. Uh, I've gotten to know the families, and I'm inspired by them, and I'm impressed by their patience uh, and by their, their dogged, uh, persistence in not only supporting uh, their their lost uh, sisters or or or, or mother uh, or or daughter, uh, but also really uh, you know really standing for victims a a everywhere. So I want to I want to I want to thank them all uh, so much, uh, and I want to let them know that we're going to continue to work this case. Um, the next thing I want to do, I just want to thank I th want to thank our, our partners. I want to thank. Uh, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison, um, you know, we said it was a change. And when we talked about, you know, not going before the media, if you see, um, you know, me, Rodney did go before the media. Uh, but it was always in a very controlled manner, and it was always with a controlled purpose. Again, we did that because we knew we were playing before a, an audience of one person. Uh, and so I want to thank Rodney for his partnership. Uh, most importantly, I want to thank Rodney for his integrity. I think in the past, what the reason why uh, uh, these uh, various investigations fell short was because there was a lot of outside influence 
a lot of people who had nothing to do with the investigation, nothing to do with the, um, uh, the, the uh, investigation or any of the agencies that were actually handling the investigation, they still asserted pressure on those investigations. That did not happen with our task force. Our task force were, was run by our members, uh, and we did uh, what we thought was in the best, uh, the best investigative steps and what was in the best interest of the, of the investigation. So I want to thank Rodney for that uh, and, and his whole team. I, I know that we have Suffolk County homicide here, Kevin Byer. Uh, we, we, we've got uh, Inspector Rowan. Uh, and I know that they've been around, and I know that they're here, and I know that they stand in the shoes of their past investigators, and I want to congratulate them, and I want to thank them for their partnership. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, Sheriff Errol Toulon. Everything I said about uh, Rodney, I could say about Errol. Uh, Errol uh, is an unbelievable partner. Uh, he was an unbelievable partner in this case. Uh, during the, the pendency of this case, and one of the reasons why we, we had to take this case down was we learned that the defendant was using these alternate uh, um, identities and these alternate instruments to continue to patronize sex workers, uh, which of course made us very nervous. Uh, but with, with the help of, of um, the sheriff and his database and his uh, analysts, we were able to continually uh, stay uh, one uh, one step ahead of the defendant. So, so thank you, uh, Sheriff Toulon. I want to thank um, the FBI. I know um, a Assistant Director in Charge Michael Brodak is here. I want to thank his entire team. You know, when you have the FBI, uh, not only do you have tremendous resources uh, and insight, uh, whether it's the Behavioral U uh, Sciences Unit, whether it's CAST, uh, whether it's CART, which is their computer unit, but you also have the ability to seize a car in uh, South Carolina. I can't seize a car in South Carolina without uh, the FBI. So, so thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for your partnership. And thank you for, for, for your willingness uh, to work with us. I want to I wanna, um, thank the New York State Troopers. Uh, I know Major Udice is here and his team. Uh, you know, uh, this case is, is emblematic of, of great cooperation, but we always get that same level of cooperation from the state police. Uh, no matter what uh, case we're working, so I want to thank them. Their investigators did a great uh, um, uh, did great work on this job and uh, in this case, and we couldn't have done it without them. Um, lastly, I want to thank uh, Nassau County Police Commissioner Pat Ryder. I don't know if he's here. Did he make it? <laughs> um, you know, this this case, as I said, spans you know 13, 13 years, and during that time. Um, you know, Pat Ryder has been our neighbor to the West. When it started, I think he was a sergeant, uh, detective sergeant, maybe a uh, uniform sergeant, but whatever, whenever we needed something to be done or whenever the task force needed uh, something to be done, uh, Pat Ryder would do it, and he would do it quietly without much fanfare, and we know he would keep the confidentiality of our grand jury and our investigation. So I want to thank him for that. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to uh, Commissioner Rodney Harrison. Okay, before we hear from Commissioner, Commissioner Rodney Harrison, I just quickly want to pause it and just let you know what's up, what's, what can we expect. I just received um, some documents as well um, that I've been looking for. <laughs> so thank you so much to Copper Horse, one of the mods here, for sending that to me. And if we're going to go over that, we're going to go over an interview that he's done uh, with... Like a journalist, a French guy, from what I remember. We're going to go have an interview. We're going to look at documents. We're going to look at articles. We're going to look at exactly how he was busted, pictures. Okay, so just hang in there. We're watching the press conference. If, and it's no disrespect to anyone on the screen, if they speak a little slower and we want to speed it up a little bit, I might put it at 1.25 speed, maybe. But otherwise, we're just going to play at normal speed. We've still got half an hour left of this press conference, okay? 30 minutes of press conference, document time. Here's a picture on the screen of the suspect 59 year old Rex Hoyman, right from uh, Massapequa, is that how we say that? <laughs> We're going to go over all of that afterwards. We're just going to listen to this press conference for half an hour more, then it'll be done. Document time, article time, interview time, deep dive. We're doing it, okay? I'm fine guys, don't worry, I'm energized, I'm good, let's go.
Good afternoon. Today is a good day. And before I acknowledge the individuals that had a role in getting to this place, I would first and foremost like to offer my deepest condolences to the family members. To the family members of Amber Costello, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman. I can only imagine what you had to adore over the last decade regarding knowing that your killer was still loose. God bless you. Oh, man. It gives me chills. This is amazing. Like goosebumps. I mean, you know. Shame. The families. So I've had, I've had the privilege of being the police commissioner it's nearly about two years now. And uh, I have had that investigative experience in the NYPD uh, as a detective, as the chief of detectives. And when I was going through the process of being the police commissioner, my engagement with the county executive was I was very familiar with this unfortunate homicide, homicides. And I wanted to let it be known that this was going to be our number one priority. But I also want to make this very clear, that this arrest was made by the investigators assigned to the task force. I announced during a press conference 18 months ago about a new team effort that was going to investigate the homicide, and that was going to consist of people from Ray Tierney's office, from Mike Brodick, FBI. Mike, thank you so much. State Police, Steve, appreciate your support. Dr. Earl Talon, Jr., thank you, sir as well as the investigators from the homicide detectives in Suffolk County. Gentlemen, thank you for all you've done working together with us, making sure we are here today. I also want to thank my partner, Pat Ryder. Pat, good seeing you, man. And uh, former NYPD Police Commissioner, Keyshawn Sewell, for providing resources to assist in the investigation that brought us here today. So one of my first acts was to survey the scene. When I first got assigned as a police commissioner, me and Kevin Breyer went over to Gilgo Beach. I want to uh, thank Kevin. You know, when I first met Kevin, he broke the whole case down and where we stood. He knew the case like the back of his hand. He worked tirelessly in this case. Uh, Kev was in charge of overseeing the task force since its creation, and you did a phenomenal job, Kev. Thank you. So there's something that I learned from a former NYPD police commissioner, James O'Neill, which is in order to fight crime or to solve investigations, you have to make sure you're working with your law enforcement partners. The blueprint in making this arrest was a whole team effort. Everybody left their eagles at the door and made sure that they brought the knowledge and the resources to this investigation. Fresh eyes on this case and the resiliency of our investigators allowed us to identify Rex Hureman. Ladies and gentlemen, Rex Hureman is a demon that walks among us, a predator that ruined families. And if not for the members of this task force, he would still be on the streets today. However, even with this arrest, we're not done. There's more work to do in this investigation regarding the other victims of the Gilgo Beach bodies that were discovered. I'm going to encourage anybody that still has information, call our Crime Stoppers hotline, 1-800-220-TIPS. I want to recognize 
and thank my chief of detectives, John. Thank you for your great work. Deputy Police Commissioner Anthony Carter, both of you who provided update information regarding the case and let it be known if there was any resources that they needed that you brought it to my attention. Since the discovery of the first victim, there's been a lot of scrutiny and criticism regarding how this investigation was handled. I will tell you this, the investigators were never discouraged. They continued and, and uncovered evidence and followed leads. They never stopped working and will continue to work tirelessly until we bring justice to all the families involved. Last but not least, I want to thank my predecessors uh, that came before me, the work that they did. I want to thank them for really uh, laying the foundation that helped us get to here today. Thanks, Ray. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Brodak. I'm the FBI Special Agent in Charge of the New York Office's Criminal Division. The FBI expended its full set of resources in support of our local and state partners to advance this investigation. The charges show that we can overcome the most difficult challenges when federal, state, and local law enforcement work together under one task force. While nothing can fill the void caused by the loss of a loved one, through today's announcement, we are hopeful that the families of the victims begin to experience a sense of peace, closure, and justice, and that the general public feels safer knowing that an alleged killer is no longer roaming free. The actions taken today should serve as a reminder that the FBI, along with our law enforcement partners, will continue to be resolute in our determination to bring all offenders to justice, no matter how many years has passed. I would like to thank Suffolk County District Attorney Ray Tierney and his prosecution team, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison and the Suffolk County Police Department, the New York State Police, and the investigators and staff of the FBI New York Field Office, including the Long Island Violent Crime Task Force. Thank you. What a day, you guys. Thank you for being here with me as we witness this. Welcome, Katie. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Errol D. Toulon, Jr., and I'm the sheriff of Suffolk County. I would profoundly like to thank the district attorney and the police commissioner uh, for including me not only here today, but for including the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office and recognizing the importance of jail intelligence. It is extremely important when you realize that we created our human trafficking unit in 2018, that there are victims in our community and that intelligence is being shared by many of the men and women who are incarcerated today. And we have seen many disjointed investigations occur, and leading up to the leadership of these two men have really brought everything together. I am proud that today we stand here a little bit closer to bring closure to the families and extend my deepest condolences to all of you. Because of the nature of this case, and recognizing that human trafficking and corrections intelligence is so important, we realize that there are many other cases that are going on that will, we will help to solve going forward. So I thank my intelligence staff and team that are here today for their diligence and their work. While we did our part in this investigation, we continue because we have to house this individual. We have already designated uh, or talked about certain locations where we will house them, and in addition, the security measures we will implement in our facility uh, to make sure that this individual is brought to justice the way he should be. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Colonel Richard Allen, uh, the field commander with the state police. And I want to start by expressing my, my sincere condolences to the family members that are here today. Although losing a loved one, you can never 
completely get rid of that pain, but hopefully these steps that are taken here today are a step in the right direction for you to start in the healing process or work through the healing process. I want to thank the members of the task force, all the agencies you see behind me. When we were approached in 2022 to be part of this task force, we were fully engaged. Um, glad to be part of this. Uh, we, we assigned investigators on a full-time basis. You know, what, what you see um, being done here today is, is the end game of agencies working together, as was said before, with no egos, all egos put aside with the sole mission to find justice for these victims. You know, um, here in, in Troop L, Major Steven Udis oversees the operations down here. He has been intricately involved in this task force since we became partners with it. And I'm going to ask him to come up and, and say a few words or expand upon this a, a little bit, our role in the, in the task force. Let me just pause it quickly. So we've still got about 20 minutes left of the press conference, just in case you want to know. Um, Algoma once says it's amazing that these criminals still do what they do with DNA and pinpoint cell phone tracking must be their egos. The thing is, this one started in the 90s, late 90s, you know, so <laughs> technology caught up to him. So let's continue on. We're going to be finishing the press conference. We'll be looking at documents. We'll be looking at articles and also we'll be seeing him talk, the suspect, because he did an interview and I'll be showing you that YouTube video as well. <clears throat> Thank you, Colonel. Good afternoon. I'm Major Steve Utis, New York State Police Troop Bell, Long Island Troop Commander. I'd like to take this opportunity to start off by acknowledging the DA, Ray Tierney, and Commissioner Rodney Harrison for having the vision to see that forming a task force might breathe new light into this investigation. The State Police were asked in early 2022 to join this task force, and once requested, we were more than willing to do so. We were also very pleased that we were able to make some very meaningful contributions in this case to help propel it forward. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of the task force members from the different agencies and congratulate them on a job well done. I think this case represents an example of what we as law enforcement can do when we pool our resources together and we work together. I would also like to mention the state police member assigned to this task force. You were provided with a mission, and that mission was to participate in this task force, put everything else that you were doing aside, assume, place 100% of your attention on this case, and help push this case forward. You more than accomplished that mission. I congratulate you on a job well done, and I commend you for your outstanding work. To the families, I'd like to say that on behalf of myself and the New York State Police, we offer you our deepest condolences. We recognize that these crimes may have happened years ago, but that pain continues. Our hope is that this development today provides you with some relief and some comfort, knowing that the person responsible for, the, for your loved one's death is now being held accountable and he's no longer a threat to anyone else in society. I want you to know additionally that the state police is not done here. We are remaining committed and will continue to support the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, the Suffolk County Police Department, and this task force as we move into the next phase of this process. That's the prosecution. I would also like to say something to everyone watching this with us today. There's been a lot of discussion here today about charges, about the suspect, about what happened, but I would also like everybody to take the time to join with me and keep the families of the victims and the victims themselves in your thoughts and in your prayers. Each one of these victims was a family member and a loved one, and their void and their loss caused great pain, and they did not deserve this. Nobody is deserving of this. We hope this development today will bring some comfort to them as they move forward. Thank you. Richie, thank you so much for the coffee. <laughs> thank you. I can't believe what we're seeing. This is so amazing. They did so Anybody great. Do you have any questions? Uh, the important thing you said uh, that um, the investigation had to be cut short at one point because of, I think, your age, um, and seriousness of the offense. Yeah. Do the safety of people in the community. Can you just explain that more here?
my word. It feels like when your ear just pops because finally they got the the dual audio going. Both ears. Okay, okay. So here we go. Oh, I, uh, sure. Before I do that, I just, you know, I'm standing back there. I realize I didn't thank my own team. Um, <laughs> so uh, so I, I want to thank, uh, thank my chief investigator, Rick Zacharis, uh, who is uh, without, uh, I'm so lucky to have. I want to thank uh, Nick Santamartino, ADA Nick Santamartino, uh, ADA Michelle Haddad, ADA uh, Andrew Lee. Uh, I also want to thank my, my chief uh, assistant, uh, uh, Alan Bodie, and I want to thank all of the incredible, incredible analysts uh, that we have working for us in the Suffolk County DA's office. So, having said that, I'll now answer your question. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that there was a tension in, in, in the task force, and it was a, it was a, it was a good tension uh, because, you know, there's a tension between getting the, the evidence necessary to charge somebody, but also keeping the public safe. Uh, and that's the tension that we always deal with. Uh, so as we were working forward, we were, and, and you know, we had uh, Suffolk County PD, we had the FBI uh, surveilling the defendant. Uh, obviously, that can't be all the time, uh, but we were, you know, we were reasonably assured with that. Uh, but this individual was, was, was a person that continued to uh, patronize sex workers at all hours of the night. Uh, he continued to use fictitious um, um, uh, email addresses, fictitious identities, burner phones. Uh, and so as we, we worked through the case uh, and we got closer and closer, uh, all of a sudden, uh, and we built the evidence, suddenly the balance tips uh, in favor of, uh, of public safety. So, uh, you know, I think we, we wanted, we all wanted as a task force to continue it, but uh, I think collectively we felt that it was time uh, to, to, you know, to strike that balance and, 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 and to take him off the street. So that's what we did. Yeah, you see that you have some of the family members gathered here today. Uh, could you introduce some of them and if they wanted to say anything about the news? That they I, I don't believe they, uh, does, that, does anyone, anybody want to say anything? No, they're, they're here. They're, they're, I can tell you they're the Waterman, uh, uh, Bartholomew, and Brainerd Barnes uh, family members, but uh, they're here. Uh, they're here first and foremost to support uh, their loved ones, and we're, we're, we're happy and grateful to have them here. Are you looking at any other people? Do you believe that there are multiple people responsible for the remains, for the murders? The, uh, this, this portion had to deal with the deaths of these four young women, uh, and that's what we focused on. That was what the grand jury investigation was focused on. I talked about the commonalities. Uh, and the commonalities, uh, uh, all those commonalities that we talked to were uh, unique to these uh, four separate cases. Uh, so that's what we're uh, working on. I think the other uh, members of the task force said, you know, we've got, we're going to continue, uh, you know, and continue to work and investigate and try to get a small measure of closure for all the victims' families. But for right now, uh, this defendant, uh, it's this defendant with these 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 uh, these four victims. So yeah. the remains, so is there any relationship the between the the person the interim and, and the other remains, other than the four women? Um, I'm 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 here to talk about uh, what we did with regard to these four victims, and as I I opened my my um, uh, my ad address by talking about the need to maintain uh, investigative secrecy. So we are going to maintain that investigative secrecy, and when I talk about other individuals and other cases, it will be after they have uh, they have handcuffs on. Ray, you what mentioned that there was a, uh, a New York State uh, officer made the link with Herman. He looked at data, and, and that's when Herman came up shortly after the task force. The, uh, Can you explain uh, that? Can you talk a little bit more about that? So, I mean, you know, we talked about uh, we talked about you know some of the evidence that was there. Uh, you know, obviously the cast uh, that that's, uh, that phone evidence. Uh, was 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 great evidence, um, and then there were other commonalities. There were other inv uh, investi uh, investigations, but I think one of the good things about having a task force is basically you strip it all down, uh, and you start from scratch, and then you use the DA's office because the DA's office has to get you uh, li the lifeblood of of an investigation is information, and the way you get information on a cold case is the district attorney's office issues subpoenas in conjunction with the investigators and execute search warrants, again, in conjunction with the, with the, um, uh, the investigators. And, you, and then, you, then you mine all that data, and then, and then you let that data take you where you need to go. So that's what we did in this case. And six weeks in, 
the, uh, the break in the case, uh, a significant break in the case, was, uh, was, the, uh, was the avalanche and the fact that this guy, uh, you know, he was described by witnesses as an ogre. He, he, he matched the description of the ogre and where he lived. The avalanche, the, the link there, was that, that would jump out? Well, I mean, it was, it was a lot of things, right? It was, it was, it was his uh, physical size. It was his, uh, where he lived, where he worked. Uh, the fact that his uh, um, family members were out of the country at the time of the commission of the three murders. Uh, the fact that um, he, he, now then you start looking into him and then you start getting burner phones. Well, he has, uh, we had up to seven burner phones. He's using these fictitious email addresses. Um, so then, so then you, you follow him and you get an abandonment sample. Then you go back to some of the old evidence. So it's, you know, there, there, are, there are, I mean, f March 14th, uh, 2022 was a, a huge day for the task force. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's never one piece of evidence. What database did its name come up? You said that its name Well, there's, I mean, there's, there's like the, what they, they'll call lawman searches. And basically what it is, is is you run a certain make and model of a car and certain other, you know, where you live or, or what you do for a living, and then you get data, and then you mine that data for something that would, would, would uh, match with, uh, with, your, uh, with your case. And you do that, you don't do that just, you know, you do that a hundred times, you know, until, until it hits, until you get the right data points. Did the suspect say anything when he was arrested? Was he surprised? Did he uh, admit to the murders? So we can't, we, we can't talk about, um, we can't talk about uh, ethically in New York, we can't talk about any statements that the defendant made, but he, uh, you know, he made, uh, we're not turning over any statements. Uh, was he surprised? <laughs> um, I would say he was, yes. You mentioned a unique feature that helped you track down the, uh, the avalanche. Yeah. So the, in between the in between the bed and the and the and the, the cab, there's like a little triangular uh, um, ornament almost, and it, it's it's unique in the way it's configured. It's unique to to the avalanche. It was unique to the avalanche at that time, uh, and that was something that was pointed out by by witnesses. Might there be other What? Well, you know, the investigation is is continuing, and and I would never say never. Um, and we're going to continue to look at, again, now th this is a, a watershed event in, the, in, in this case. Uh, and so we have now uh, are going out and we're, we're ex executing more search warrants. We'll get more information, more data, and, you know, together uh, we'll look at that and see where it leads. Can you share how the other victims' families are feeling today? I'm sorry? Did you speak to the other victims' families? Did they tell you how they're feeling today? Which uh, uh, so so this investigation had to do with um, uh, th these these four victims. So we've been in touch with the four victims through the grand jury uh, process. Um, with regard to victims in general and, and other victims, uh, you know, who lost people in the vicinity of that area, you know, we speak uh, to to our victims all the time. But that that's those are conversations that we keep between ourselves. The grand jury. Why is one victim that has not been linked to the charges? So, uh, you know, it, it's, um, uh, so first off, Maureen Brainer Barnes, she, the, the other uh, three, one, uh, one was, was, uh, was went uh, missing in 2009, uh, I believe the others in 2010. Um, she was in 2007, so it, it, was, it was a little bit more remote in time. Uh, we are, um, we are uh, pro uh, working through evidence. A lot of that evidence has to do with forensic evidence. Uh, and analyses that are not completed, uh, but once those analyses are completed, uh, we are we are uh, we feel good about the case, and we're going to just continue to let that process go. And again, I think the the the, the um, initial plan was to allow the grand jury investigation to go a little uh, further, but uh, at a certain time, uh, again, the the task force felt, you know, we need to uh, we we for for for. for Reasons having nothing to do with the evidence in the case, we need to take it down. And so, can you just sum up this defendant? You've seen a lot. Can you just sum up this defendant and what he is? Um, you know, he's. Uh, you know, it's it's it's. Um, as a prosecutor and as investigators, you know, he is charged with a crime. Uh, there are certain elements in which we ha we need to prove that crime. We are going to prove those elements. We're going to work hard. We're going to convict him, and we're going to hold uh, him responsible for what he did. And whether 
you know, what I think of him personally, whether I like him, whether I don't like him, whether I doesn't matter. We are going to hold him responsible for what he did in this case. When is the grand jury impaneled, and is it concluded? Um, the grand jury is um, it's a secret, uh, and we're going to keep it secret. Um, uh, but we have an investigation, and it is continuing. There was a belt that was presented to the publicly by the Suffolk County Police Department a few years ago with initials on it. I think one of the initials appeared to be MW, uh, MH or WH or something along those lines. Obviously, this guy's got an H in his name. Sure does. Can you talk about that? I mean, uh, you know, he has an H in his name. He is, uh, so it's, what was it, HM? Or WH. Or WH. Or WH. Or WH. Yeah, so he's got an H in his name and other um, other relatives in, in his family have a W in their name. What that means, I don't know. Can you talk about alleged motive? Why? Alleged motive? Why? Um, I think that when you look at his uh, internet searches, um, you know, I, I think that um, uh, provides a little uh, in, uh, in, insight into his state of mind. Um, and again, we don't have to prove motive. We have to prove the elements, and that's what we're going to do. You said that he was continuing to patronize sex workers until recently. How did you guys feel comfortable ensuring that you weren't you know, putting these women at risk? Given the well, uh, you know, you you, uh, you, know, you said women. Um, you know, with regard to the sex workers, what we did was uh, we, we had them under surveillance. Uh, we had other means of monitoring him, uh, and again, it's uh, it's a um, it's a process, and and that process is you have to balance uh, the ability to to to, prove, to find e enough evidence to charge him and hold him responsible with the balance of keeping the public safe, uh, and it's it's not easy. Uh, and we decided at a certain point in time that the you know that we needed to take him down because we didn't feel comfortable with it. So that's what we did. The frequency of his searches or the Um, I don't think it was so much. Uh, I don't. I don't think it was so much uh, uh, the searches. I think. I think that the conduct of the defendant was was very consistent. I think, but uh, the the quality of our evidence was increasing uh, by the by the by the day by the moment uh, due to the great work of our, our task force uh, uh, partners. So at, at a certain point in time, we're like, okay, uh, you know, we can we can do this. Was there a murder weapon, or was this all by physical? Uh, the uh, uh, the um, uh, I believe the uh, the cause of death is homicidal violence. Obviously, uh, given the length of time and, and 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 the exposure to a very harsh environment, uh, forensically there there uh, was not uh, you know not a, a lot that that could be done with with, with the remains other than uh, come to that conclusion. If he owned 92 guns. It was said at the arraignment that he had. Uh, a he has. Uh, he has. Uh, he has uh, uh, permits for 92 guns. He has a very large safe in which guns are kept. Uh, we are uh, continuing to um, execute search warrants, so I'm sure we'll have that uh, answer uh, shortly. There's quite a large gap between when he lost the gun to Dan's arrest. Are there any concerns that he committed any other crimes in that time period before the task force was set up? I'm sorry? Is there any concern that obviously he lost, he was known to commit a crime in 2010 and it's now 2013? The task force was set up in 2022, that's quite a large gap. Is there any concern? I think there's. I think there's. Uh, with, uh, there's always concerns. I think you know. We. I. I got into office in January 22. Uh, we worked with our partners. We. We had our first meeting uh, February 1st, uh, and we worked. And and you know, March 14th was really that watershed day. And when I tell you, you know, I'd like to brag and say that my office was really working hard, which we were. Uh, but no other agency was working any less hard than we were. Once we realized what we had and we realized the stakes. All of our partnership, uh, all of our partners really worked. Uh, I mean, I, I think if you look at, at the folks standing here, uh, I don't think that, you know, in the last 48 hours, any of us have gotten more than three hours sleep. Running uh, Maureen Bernard Barnes, uh, how much more do you need to actually tie it into that? Uh, we are going to continue our investigation, and when we are prepared, when we have concluded that investigation, 
uh, we will, uh, you know, we will we'll bring that uh, to a conclusion, but we will not do it before. Between all, all right, thank you. Do you have one more? Yeah, between all the search warrants and the subpoenas, were you ever, in, like, did you ever think that, that you were going to lose them? Like, you know, being between all the searching around and stuff? Like, I, you know, and I, I don't want to tell you, a, you know, exact uh, investigative techniques because they're, you know, again, part of the what reasons why they're um, effective is because people don't necessarily know what that, uh, what, what it is exactly we do. But uh, always a concern, but given the professionalism of our partners, uh, their diligence and their commitment, uh, we felt good about, about the case uh, or keeping the case going until we didn't, and then we took it down. Thank, Th thank you. you. Thanks, guys. Incredible. Okay, so we've got lots to do, so I'm just going to um, hope you hope you took some notes, guys. That was what a press conference. They, they did some amazing work. We're going to look at the document, um, and we're also going to look at some interviews now. So just give me one second. Well, I just, I would say, okay, so they, um, we'll look at the charges now. But they were focusing on the, the Gilgo 4, from what I'm understanding. And that means there could be, well, there would be many more potential victims that they would still be working on and um, to solve those cases too. This is just the beginning, as they said. This is just the beginning. So yeah, if you haven't seen this, this is a picture of, of him. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Living like literally in plain sight. Uh, let me close that. And now I want to show you quickly. There's a few things. Uh, just ex Wait, 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 wait this one even better um <laughs> the architect okay so let me take this picture off quickly his name is rex Horm horman architect married dad of two busted as the suspected long island serial killer <laughs> i think this case is going to be huge i mean if he was still you know buying burner phones and uh a patronizing sex worker. Oh, there's going to be so many more victims, I think. He wouldn't just stop in 2010, right? Yes. Okay, so now, let me put this on the screen for you. This one is an interview. This is of him. Let's just see when this took place. This was from a year ago. Bonjour. Today on Le Interview, Antoine is talking to Rex Horiman. Okay, this I'm going to put at 1.25 speed, okay? Let's go. Christ. I hope you don't mind. I brought my assistant with me, Norman. Oh, hello, Norman. <laughs> I see it's raining out. <laughs> yes, it's raining. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. please. Okay. I know. You said you'd like to do this outside, but Mother Nature is not cooperating today. Yeah, to say the least, I tell you that. Being in your office, all right? I wasn't looking forward to doing this under a scaffold. <laughs> I can understand. Okay, anyway, let's dive in. So, uh, tell us, you know, who you are, uh, you know, where you're from, and how long you've been in New York. Okay. Like um, Rex Ewerman, I'm an architect. I'm an architectural consultant. I'm a troubleshooter. Born and raised on Long Island. Okay. Been All working right. in Manhattan since 1987. Oh, wow. And now a suspected serial killer. <laughs> Okay, before, if some of you, I think some of you might feel like, wait, wait, what? Some of you just got here. So let me, let me quickly read you this. Then we're going to go back to this interview. Then we're going to look at the neighbor's interview. And we also have the document, a deep dive document. It's 36 pages. So we'll be here for a while, okay? <laughs> Johnny says, have Clemente update profile. I'm sure there's more victims. I'm sure there is, right? So I quickly want to show you this. Wait. Wait for it, wait for it. Bring it over, bring it over. <laughs> Rex. Okay, and then we'll go back to that. This is going to be a good overview so that you guys can all be on the same page. We've done a bit of presentation. I've done a deep dive on this case before. Two episodes as well. And so you can check that out on the playlist, which is in the description box. Make sure you like the video and share it as well. And let's quickly have a look at this. They say Rex Hoyman, architect and married dad of two busted in Gilgo Beach serial killings after DNA found on pizza box. On pizza box. <laughs> Uncle Google and the pizza box got him. Okay, so a suspected serial killer has been arrested over the notorious Gilgo Beach murders on Long Island. The Post can confirm. Rex Hoyman, 59, a married architect at a New York City firm. 
you hearing this? Okay. Um, and uh, just stand by. I'm just looking what you guys are saying. Oh, thank you. So, Rex Hoyman, 59, a married architect at a New York City firm, was caught after DNA from the hair of victim Megan Waterman matched that of his, taken by investigators from a discarded pizza crust in January. Okay, the father of two, a former classmate of Hollywood actor Billy Baldwin, was arrested Thursday after cops had staked out his home on First Avenue in, now I want to pronounce that right, Massapequa Park, Long Island, and office in Midtown Manhattan. His arrest is tied to the so-called Gilgo Four, woman found wrapped in burlap within six day, oh sorry, sorry, within days of each other in late 2010, and not the other six who were later eyed as possible being connected, the source said. Okay? From a pizza crust, yes. So we continue on here. And they say, uh, Hoyman appeared in court Friday afternoon and pleaded not guilty to three counts. So three out of the Gilgo four. So you see, they're still going to be investigating the four and more. Unfortunately, there will, as we know in true crime, be many more victims, right? So for these types, as John Kelly might say, it's like an addiction. They would just go carry on and on and on. Massa Piqua says, Moniz, <laughs> thank you so much, <laughs> Moniso NYC. Okay, so he appeared in court on Friday afternoon, pleaded not guilty. So this is breaking news from today, right? And other charges related to the deaths of three women over 10 years ago. The lifelong suburbanite who was emotionless in court was also named the prime suspect in the fourth killing. So there he is. Here's the, the pizza crust box, I guess. <laughs> I don't know if it is the one, but they're showing it. Interesting, interesting. The discarded pizza box, they say. That's the, there it is, the discarded pizza box. All right. And here he is. In plain sight, you would not really look at him and be like, damn, that's a serial killer, right? We still can't do that right now because he's innocent or proven guilty. But the press conference sounds, they sound very confident that they've caught someone they've been looking for for a long time. So there's lots of videos that are out and about now, including some from this arrest uh, scene and everything. So I'm going <laughs> to... I can't go over everything because then we'll be here literally all night. They say ahead of his court appearance, a bail application revealed several shocking details about his crimes. Cell phone bills linked to Hoyman revealed that he used a burner phone to meet up with three of the four victims. He was also linked to one of the cell phones on a surveillance video that showed him purchasing the device at a store in Midtown Manhattan. A burner phone allegedly used by Hoyman placed a menacing call to victim Melissa Bartholomew's relative after her death. Horeman's wife was traveling out of state during the murders of Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Lynn Costello, which was speculated that did he kill in the summer when his family was away? Did they go on summer holiday or what? Seems so. Records of... So this is actually a good summary, and this might help us not go through the 36-page document right now, because that'll probably take an hour, and I'm wondering... I will, I will, just, I will just be checking. <laughs> I'm checking with management. <laughs> um... Can we do it or not? So, but let's look at this because this is a good summary. It's bullet points, which we love. And if we look at the bullet points, then we could look at that interview and we could also look at the neighbor's interview at a normal speed. How about that? How about that? Sounds like a good deal. Part one, right? Actually, this is the third time I'm covering the case, but this is the first time that we actually have a suspect now because it's breaking news. So they say Hoyman's wife was traveling out of state during the murders of Bartholomew, Megan Waterman and Amberlynn Costello. Records obtained from Tinder revealed the burner phone was linked to a fictitious account for Andrew Roberts using an email that Hoyman also accessed from his personal cell phone. Selfies that appeared to have been taken by Hoyman were sent to solicit sex on the email account and associated with his dating profile. Two of the burner phones were used extensively between 2021 and 2023 to contact sex workers and massage parlors. An email address linked to one of the burner phones was used to conduct thousands of searches related to sex workers. CP as well. Whoa. And sadistic torture related sex acts such as girl begging for S-A-P-O-R-N. Oh my word. This is terrifying. Okay, trigger warning everyone. Damn. Okay, hold on. We've got to put that trigger warning up. Hmm. 
Are we ready? It's pretty bad. Uncle Google. This is an Uncle Google from like sinister places, like really bad. <laughs> this is not a Walmart one. This is much worse. Where they say pretty girl with bruised face. P-O-R-N. And tied up in R-A-P-E-D. P-O-R-N. That's for YouTube, just in case you wonder why am I not speaking like an adult. Can't sometimes. They will like literally. <laughs> See, Sam, thank you so much, Pranil. Exactly. I hate it when they call it. We know this, right? When they call it CP. Mm -mm, mm -mm. No, <laughs> you're going to keep me renting again. Child. We take a break. Take a break. Sexual abuse material. That's what that is. See, Sam, not CP. Thank you. So, numerous searches about the Gilgo Beach murders were also linked to the email address associated with the burner phone, including, why hasn't the Long Island serial killer been caught? <laughs> he googled this. Why hasn't the Long Island serial killer been caught? Why could law enforcement not trace the calls made by Long Island serial killer and for the task force investigating him? There were also queries related to specific victims and their relatives, as well as podcasts and documentaries relating to the case. No, he did a deep dive on his own case. Oh, no. Of course they would. Um, Nomad Beads, welcome, welcome. Sure, okay. Numerous, okay, wait, wait. Yeah, so we saw that. Um, an IP address used to book flights for Herman and his wife on JetBlue also accessed gilgonews.com, a website maintained by authorities to share updates on the murder case. We, that's the one. That's the one I'm talking about with a really great go there. Well, I'll link it in the description box. Don't go there now. <laughs> Afterwards, okay. Gilgonews.com is a really good uh, website with the timeline, with the maps and everything as well. Okay. So a website maintained by authorities to share updates on the murder case. Hoyman's wife's DNA was believed to be found on three of the victim's bodies. DNA testing on a water bottle from outside Hoyman's home was determined to be a match to a sample of a woman's hair found on tape used to tie up Costello and Waterman, as well as the belt used to bind victim Maureen Brainard Barnes's feet. One more time, Hoyman's wife's DNA was believed to be found on three other victims' bodies. DNA testing on a water bottle from outside his home was determined to be a match to a sample of a woman's hair found on tape used to tie up Costello and Waterman, as well as the belt used. DNA testing, a match, as well as a belt used to bind. I'm just thinking of that belt, that's why I'm going over so much. I'm like, what, what, what? <laughs> Authorities believe that heavy set Waterman matches the description of the ogre-like John. <laughs> oh, they're throwing shade already, okay. The ogre-like John seen with Costello before she vanished. Hoyman drives a first-generation Chevrolet Avalanche, the same vehicle that a witness in Costello's case was driven by the suspect. Mm, mm, mm. Hoyman is the owner and founder of Midtown architecture firm RH Consultants and Associates, which counts Catholic Charities, NYC DEP Sewage Treatment, and American Airlines as clients. Wow. Okay, okay. Perfect. All right. So what I'm going to do now quickly is this one, this one. Wait, they say here kids were told not to visit Rex Horman's house on Halloween. I just wanted to quickly see that. <laughs> then we're going to look at the interview of the neighbor as well. I really want to see that. What does a neighbor say, right? Horman was arrested by police Thursday night in his home in Massa Pequot Park, New York, being searched on, on Friday by investigators. Horman's arrest comes after a long chain of unsolved murders that occurred on Long Island over a span of years that police believed were the work of a serial killer. Over the course of the investigation, 11 sets of human remains were discovered across the island. But Hoyman, a 59-year-old architect who worked at an architectural firm in New York City, was arrested in connection to the murders of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, Amberlynn Costello and Maureen Brainard Barnes, also known as the Gilgo Four. So that is what they said this investigation was about. But there are other victims that they potentially have connected and will be investigating. And I'm sure there's going to be many more, very sadly. Julie Polito, thank you so much for your sticker. And as the detective said, if, you, if you're seeing this and you know this guy or you've encountered him or you can hand in any tips, please do call the tip line. It can really, really help. So... 
They say the four women's remains were first found along property on Gilgo Beach in Suffolk County. Newsweek reached out to Suffolk County Police Department by email for comment. Neighbours told Newsweek on Friday that they barely knew him and said that he was very quiet. However, one of the neighbours told Newsweek that children were urged to stay away from his house during Halloween. There is a picture of him. Yeah, he's definitely not looking happy there. Booking photo. Here's, oh, mugshot time. Okay, booking photo. We like that. Booking photo of Rex Hoyman, the Gilgo Beach murder suspect. One of Hoyman's neighbors told Newsweek that children were advised to stay away from his house on Halloween. Most people don't knock on his door, said Barry Auslander, one of Hoyman's neighbors. During Halloween, the kids were st told to stay away. He's not a very nice person. Auslander added that Hoyman's house was dilapidated inside and out. Auslander said he didn't know Hoyman well and had never spoken with him, but had seen him walking to the train often. Auslander said that he has lived in Mesa... Pequa Park for 13 years and that he wasn't surprised at Hoyman's arrest because of other various unrelated crimes that have occurred in the area. Oh, tell us more. However, Auslander was surprised that police arrested Hoyman as a suspect in the Gilgo 4 murders because he thought the case had gone cold. Ooh, that must be so hectic. Gumercindo Campas, welcome to Grizzly $1 supporter. So, okay, we've looked at that. Now, what I want to show you, just one more, just give me one second again. <laughs> I'm just going to always resize things for you. I'll put all this in the description box. I'll link it all for you so that you could see it. Um, in this interview right here, what I'm going to do is link it in the description box because I prefer if you could watch it at your own pace, at your own, you know, at your leisure so that we don't have to rush through it or anything. But I did find he said something interesting at around 16 minutes or so. So let's put it back to normal speed like this and then we'll just um let's go forward to around around here let's listen from around here i mean damn here he is look at him look at this guy whoa okay work for either attorneys or have to look up something historical yeah yeah i need the reference for that point in time exactly yeah Don't hit us with the songs now. Oh, uh, taught you about yourself. I think it's taught me more about how to understand people. Because dealing with the technical aspects yeah. is something a person can learn. Mm -hmm. You go to school and through an architectural program. You work for the experience of doing architecture you get your license to practice yeah, yeah as your time goes on you learn about the buildings and about the codes and the different buildings of time frames i'm dealing with a building from the 1880s right now you mm -hmm. know how they react but yeah. it's the people how they're all so different and how you deal with the people i think is one of the more interesting aspects that have come out of this. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. My last question. If you were a tool or an object to help you uh, in your, uh, to help you to bring your business to greater heights, what would it be? Some people in the chat were saying, what if this guy was like an FBI undercover agent or something that's interviewing him? I'm not sure, but in, but the interesting question nonetheless, if you were a tool, what would you be huh, to help your business? So this this is interesting. The guy's thinking now. Let's see what he says. That's an interesting question. I know. <laughs> because for what I do, we have to have so many tools in the toolbox. Uh, just one. Just one. Just one. Or an object. It doesn't have to be a tool. It can be an object. You know what? Yeah. I know. All right. One of the things I learned from my father was furniture building. Okay. He was an aerospace engineer and built satellites. <laughs> and Runs in the family, yeah? building <laughs> things. <laughs> and <laughs> built furniture at home. And I still build it in the same exact workshop. So? I have one tool that's pretty much used in almost every job. And it's actually a cabinet maker's hammer. Oh, okay, and Kevin Nates Maker Hammer. Okay. It is persuasive enough <laughs> when I need to persuade something. It Not someone. Something. <laughs> and it always yields excellent results. Yeah. And at the end of the project, 
whatever piece of furniture or what I'm working on, it always helps it come out beautifully. Okay, great. So you that was pretty interesting. If that hammer is later revealed as part of this case, oh my word, that will be very interesting because of the way that he says it. Damn, bro. It would be kind of a, that kind of hammer for your uh, for your business. That's what you're saying. If you that doesn't to, exist, that's what you would be. Sometimes I have to be the heavy framing hammer. <laughs> the heavy framing hammer. Other times I'm the lightweight hammer just to <laughs> nudge things along. All right. I guess it's a hammer. We got. <laughs> and I would just love if this was just a random interview. Amazing, interesting. But if this was actually coordinated. <laughs> How brilliant was that then? Imagine if later it's like, well, yeah, we sent him in there to ask him some questions and laugh a lot and be like, come on, bro, tell us. And he's like, okay, you know, like, oh, wow, you're getting all excited there. Yes, yes, let your ego be stroked. You're amazing. You're so funny. Tell us more, right? Whoa. Okay, so now what I want to show you is the neighbor's one. And I think what I'm going to decide to do, because we saw the bullet points, is that document is 36 pages and I'm, I'll do it with you however i would like to just delay that a bit because i like to first check documents before i just go live with it because sometimes things that should be redacted are not redacted and as you know i'm very protective of victims of their families um, and the victims include his wife and children so i just want to make sure that there's nothing in there that could be putting anyone at risk um and well, including my audience, we don't know how deep diving that uh, <clears throat> the google searches are we just gotta i just want to make sure okay so i'll do that at another time with you guys because you know I love documents um, so yes okay okay now what I want to show you is the neighbors interview which is right here Joey Petroni Petroni uh, just ex last night what happened uh, last night I went for a bicycle ride at 11, about 11 o'clock at night so I'm crazy and uh, while riding my bike I <laughs> The neighbor is like, went on a bicycle ride at 11 because I'm crazy. Okay, bro, come on. First impressions. They just arrested a serial killer. <laughs> anyway, I'm thankful for this neighbor's interview. Let's hear what he's got to say. <gasps> okay. And look, I can also go to bi for bicycle rides at 11. So he's not crazy. Sir, I object. You're not crazy. Okay. I also do it. Especially after days like this, you know. So, let's, okay, let's listen. So a bus sitting over here. This road was closed. There were a few. I didn't know there were police. I didn't know, you know standing at the corners and uh it seemed like every corner had had people standing on it and then i woke up this morning to this chaos i had no idea it was this this big whatever it was you know whatever the investigation was last night um but i did lock all my doors and uh my wife uh walked the dog the opposite way <laughs> um, what's your crazy. reaction my reaction is uh this is nuts it's really really crazy you never know yeah, you, know, you, you never know who your neighbors are, right? It's crazy, man. So, uh, thank God he's been caught, though, right? Think about that. That's uh, a, a relief. You know, everybody's always wondering who the heck this guy was. And, uh, he lived a couple of houses away from me. So. <laughs> We know how the internet's gonna go. People are gonna be like, oh my word, like this guy is so sus. He's not sus, you guys. Just leave him alone. <laughs> Focus on. Oh man, this Rex Horyman guy. Okay, so let me just see. I think that's that's about it that I've got for now, because I want to. And as I said, I will link all this for you. Let me just quickly see one more thing here. Wait, wait, wait for it. <laughs> There's more more pictures. There's a couple more, but it's just ones that I've I've actually shown you all three that I wanted to show you. Um, Lily Jewel says, "Grizzly to crime. Would he live in a dilapidated home as an architect? Did his family live there too?" I think his family lived there too. I mean, it's a bit odd, right? It's a bit odd that. Let me quickly check Twitter. How about that? And then, because there's always news on there. If you don't follow me on Twitter, at True Crime Gizzola is my Twitter handle. All right. So we're looking, we're looking. We've looked at the press. Okay, so we did a presentation. I oh, know, sorry, I'm over here, like all weird. <laughs> put myself here. We did a presentation, which is part of the presentation that I did as a deep dive quite a while ago, actually. I don't know the date on that, but you can see it in my... Uh, playlist which is in the description box there were two episodes and I did separate ones as well I did one for Shannon Gilbert the Gilgo 4 and the Long Island serial killer I did separate um, 
topics there if you want to deep dive those where I read the presentation at a much slower p uh, pace and uh, waffled quite a bit in between and chatted with all of you. So if you were there, you are an original grizzly. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, <laughs> the channel's grown quite a bit since then. So <laughs> go and check it out if you want to see a blast from the past. DRA Latina says definitely not in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood anymore. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Kathleen says, because you want to go to bed. Someone calls Sunny. No, I'm ignoring that comment. <laughs> I object. Ooh, okay, see, we love Twitter. Okay, wait, bring it on, bring it on over. Just wait. Look at this. There we go. And we're going to go like this. Some of the, some of the Google searches that he did. See, this is going to be part of the document. So if this is on Twitter, it should be pretty safe. But we saw some of them already. Why could law enforcement not trace the calls made by Long Island serial killer? Oh, <laughs> dumbass, they did. <laughs> Why hasn't the Long Island serial killer been caught? Long Island serial killer. This is what he Googled, right? Long Island serial killer phone call. Long Island serial killer update. Long Island serial killer update 2022. FBI active serial killers. Serial killers by state 2023. Map of all known serial killers. Unsolved serial killer cases. America's five most notorious old cases. See what I'm saying? There's going to be more victims. This guy is also ambitious in his career as a serial killer. Some of them think they've got careers as serial killers. You see what I'm saying? What a sadist as well. Whew, based on what we read, they say map. Oh, he did some map time. Okay, map of all known serial killers. Unsolved serial killer cases. America's five most notorious old cases. Is there 11 currently active serial killers? Eight terrifying active serial killers that we can't find. John Bitroff. Oh, he was interested in looking him up. He was on my presentation. Oh, no. <laughs> Imagine if he saw the presentation and he's like, hmm, let me go look into that. Who's this guy? No, no. Never mind. Okay. And <laughs> it's, it's, my stuff was way, way late in the case. It was about a year ago, right? So let's hope he never watched Grizzly 2 Crime. Megan Waterman. Melissa Bartholomew, Maureen Brainard Barnes, he, re he actually looked up the victims. Redacted name of relative of Melissa Bartholomew, redacted name of relative Megan Waterman. Cops launch Gilgo Beach Homicide Investigation Task Force, mapping the Long Island murder victims inside the Long Island serial killer in Gilgo Beach, the Gilgo Beach killer, criminal minds. And in Long Island serial killer investigation, new phone technology may be key to break the case. <gasps> oh my word. Okay, so there's that. And over here, Rose said, oh yeah, I just missed it. Oh, wait, first we've got to look at this and then we're going to look at, at what Rose said. <laughs> it was just here. Let's see the picture. Oh, no, 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 no. You see, this is part of the document. I like seeing it on Twitter quickly because then we can just see some highlights from what's in the document. I'm like, what? N no, sir. Mm -mm. <laughs> Yes, Gene says deep down he wants to see his name on the Google searches. Selfies used to link the RH, ring, RH, yeah, yeah, RH, Rex Horman, Horman to burner phone and email account. Oh, no. We got some selfies. Now, where did that go? Rose, I lost your post. <laughs> I was just looking at it. It just refreshed. You see how much news there is? I'm sure this is trending now. So much news. There we go. Here, Rose said, according to Suffolk County court documents, DNA from a discarded pizza crust was used to identify Rex Hoyman as a suspect in these horrific murders. A male hair was recovered from the burlap used to wrap the remains of his victims. It was a match. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Crusty, crusty boy. Let's call him Crusty, shall we? I don't like it when they've got cool names. Yeah, he, he raised from perdition says he thinks he's like Dexter. Yes. Okay. So, lastly, before I go, <laughs> you're probably going to be like, okay, G, I told you, only Sonny can tell me, okay? <laughs> Just hold on. This Gilgo case, it's called gilgocase.com. Look at this website here, gilgocase.com timeline. And look at it. Look at, look at how much detail there is. I believe the task force made this right. They say notes about the timeline. Cases are not officially linked to the Long Island serial killer are noted. 
Okay, link colored, link colored blue will open a pop-up window with one or more photos. More detailed information about specific victims can be found on the victims page. So I would urge you, if you've never heard of this case and you want to do a little bit of a weekend deep dive, just a little bit of light reading, <laughs> as if, right, it's going to be a deep dive, go to this um, gilgocase.com and you'll learn so much more. There's maps, there's timelines and everything here. Look at, they date it all the way back to 1982. 1997 2000 oh my gosh so yeah there, there's honestly there's so much to see a look i wonder why i can't just go up let's go up here so there's home victims timeline gilgo case dedicated to the victims of the long island serial killer fifty thousand dollar reward for information leading to his arrest i wonder if any specific tip led to this or if it was, I mean, it sounds like all that hard work with the cell phone pings and everything, right? There, there's a case summary here as well, you see? The Krusty Ogre says, right meow, exactly, the Krusty Ogre. Uh, featured evidence, okay, sorry, that was, I was like, oh, what is this? It's the tattoo of Jane Doe. Look at the belt, and his name is Rex Hoyerman. Hoyerman? Okay, so they did say there's an H in this, even if you turn it upside down, right? W-H, it could be. That could be a family member. So this is the belt they were talking about and why I paused when I was like, belt? There's also um, a podcast as well, the Lisk podcast. Go check that out. Really good too. There's so much I could say about this case, but I really don't want to keep you all night either. So go to gilgocase.com for a lot of information. You can check out my playlist with other deep dives we've done where I summarized a lot from this website as well. There's one called Mapping the Murder Victims as well, which was an incredible collection too of map points. Look at this. They say the part of, this part of the story begins in 1993. And if you scroll down, look how they show it on this map. I will link everything in the description box for you. Look here. So you can scroll down and then they show, look how they make the dots on the map. Yes, this is like what we'll probably see at trial time. A presentation like this it was so good okay so are we good everyone let me just see yes okay and as we went through the presentation earlier we went over the the profile that uh, Jim Clemente gave and he is the the writer and producer for criminal minds if you didn't know so you can also check out real crime profile that's his podcast and there's so much to check out. This case is like, <laughs> it's been a long time. And today was absolutely huge news. And I feel terrible for the, the victims' families who now, I mean, think about it. If you're like, my family member went missing. And then they say, but they could, they could be connected. It could be the Gilgo 4 and it could be a serial killer. That's already scary enough. But when you actually get to see the face of the person that they believe that he's the suspect, prime suspect in this. And then you think of now hearing about his Google searches, hearing about what he was into, what he likely did, all this kind of stuff. It's really sad for the family. It's worse. It's their worst nightmare, right? And then, of course, for his wife and kids, too. Imagine that. So, so hectic. So, sorry, I missed a lot of your comments now because I was very focused here on showing you everything that I would like to show you. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for watching. I hope that uh, you will get caught up on some of the things. You know, if you didn't know anything about it, and yeah, I'll keep you posted on this case. This case is extremely interesting, and we followed it here at Grizzly True Crime for a while, and I can't wait to see what the investigators do next. So let's take this off and wish you a wonderful night. Sunny has not told me to go to sleep yet, but uh, some of you summon Sunny. Lieutenant Peter Pranzo? <laughs> Did I miss it? Sometimes Lieutenant Peter Pranzo steps in for Sunny. <laughs> And he's allowed to tell me, you go to bed. <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone. If you were with me all day, oh my word, thank you so much. Uh, by all day, I mean we've been following a trial, the Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles trial, a death penalty trial. That's from Laredo, Texas. And then we did two streams, a morning stream, an afternoon one for the trial. There was a lot of waiting around with an epic ending to the day. If you missed that, please go and watch that. My word, believe me, if you guys have been following the trial and you missed this afternoon session because you're like, oh man, it's too much waiting around. Go there <laughs> to where that witness was. It was incredible. 
you're not going to regret it. We were like, ooh, so cool. Humiliate Burgos. So if you were there with me all day, thank you so much. Thank you for supporting the channel. Thank you to all my mods. Oh, my word. Thank you, mods. You didn't even know we were going to do the stream, did you? <laughs> Copper Horse, thank you again for sending me that huge document. You know I love documents. I'm going to be working my way through that this weekend while getting some rest and probably some boba tea and probably doing a forest jog. If I film anything in the forest, you know it's going on Patreon, of course, you guys. And the document, of course. So, I will see you. Have a happy weekend, everyone. Stay safe. Please stay safe. Look after yourself, okay? And I shall see you in the next one. Yeah, don't go. You like, play the don't go song. The don't go song is for members only. <laughs> if you guys don't know what the don't go song is, yeah, you, you'll know as a member. You can check it out on the members only playlist and any video there recently in the last three months or so. Two to three months. You'll hear the don't go song. So, I'll keep you posted. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>